Hello. Hello. I've never done this before. This is very exciting. Um, before I get started, I need to uh, read a little bit. Um, so I'll start with this. Hello and welcome to Free Play 2019's online sessions. I'm the last one. Um, hope you had a great time so far. Um, Free Play is Australia's largest and longest running independent games festival. Uh, the festival is currently running all week in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, tickets to the weekend conference are still available. And I'll tell you what, there is a killer lineup for that. Oh, I'm very, I'm very, very excited. Um, they're still available and you can find them at freeplay.net.au. If you'd like to join the conversation, our hashtag is hashtag freeplay19. Uh, and if you have any questions, you can use that hashtag or you can decide to use the YouTube uh, live uh, stream messenger service. So I guess I guess we should get into it. Hey, um, my cat is sitting next to me. So if we're all good, maybe um, he'll come over and say hello. His name's Claudio. Um, but I got to get started. Let's share different screens. I've never done this before, so please excuse me if I if I mess up somehow. Hopefully you're seeing now my presentation. I think I think you should be. Um, so here it is. Uh, why your game needs a dramaturg by me, David. Uh, that's my um, Twitter handle. So if you want to get in contact with me after or during, uh, you're more than welcome to do so. But before I get started, I always have to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that which we meet today, or even in a digital space, we need to acknowledge these these people. Um, and uh, the people that I, the land that I reside on is the, the traditional owners of that land are the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I pay my respects to the elders past, present, future, and hopefully wherever you are, if you're uh, watching this from around Australia, you're also acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that you stand on. And also hopefully um, if you're watching this internationally, you're aware of the uh, traditional uh, owners or custodians of the land that you might reside on as well. So uh, before we get right into the nitty gritty of this all, um, the first thing that I want to like suggest that you check out if you're interested in any of these concepts is Ghostlight. Um, Ghostlight is a wonderful book um, uh, written uh, by uh, Michael Mark Chemers. Um, it's an introductory handbook for dramaturgy. It's, it's like I'm just reading off the, the cover. But it is it is really beautiful, um, and it is uh, a very easy to read uh, in plain English. It's not high academic language. Um, look at dramaturgy. Some people say dramaturgy. Some people say dramaturgy. Um, I like saying both. So if I mix them up during the um, uh, session this evening, uh, you can use both. Don't stress. So before I begin, I want to uh, take that term ghost light because uh, I think it's a really beautiful term and it's a really um, wonderful concept of what dramaturgs are. So a ghost light is a light that is left on in a theatre. Um, it's left on in a theatre during uh, times when the theatre is empty. It is a singular light that resides in a space even when there is no audience to see it when there are no actors on stage for it to guide or set designers or stagehands in the wings for it to take care of. The ghost light is there when all things have disappeared, when all view viewing ship has dissipated. It is there to often, uh, for practical reasons, it's there to provide uh, light when someone initially comes into a space. Theatres are fairly dangerous, especially conventional theatres. There's usually a very long drop at the front of the stage, but um, they're also um, constructive spaces uh, in regards to there's a lot of hardware, there might be props, there might be stage and set, there might be loose nails and whatever else there might be. They're, they're, they're fairly dangerous. So you need a ghost light that lives in the um, space when, when there's no one in there. Although it's not a very sustainable practice, and to be honest, uh, in many theatres they are actually turning off their ghost lights thanks to um, thinking about their energy consumption. But I like the idea of the ghost light. Um, the title of the book is indicative of what a dramaturg is. A dramaturg is someone, and we'll get 
deep into this is someone that lives in this space without the viewership, lives in this space, um, and they care for people. But we'll we'll get into that in a in a moment. In a moment, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, first, I need to show you a beautiful picture. This is me. Hope you're not too confronted and you haven't just turned off your stream immediately. I do apologise if you're in a public space. Baris K, I hope you're enjoying this. Um, so that's me. My background is in theatre. I'm a. I would consider myself a theatre maker and then a designer. Um, not because I there's a hierarchy. It's just because I, I think I'm familiar with one more than the other. My background is I studied at Melbourne Uni in history and Middle Eastern politics. I then transitioned uh, and then I joined a physical theatre company and was a clown for five years, um, professional clown. And so here's me uh, being a clown. Um, and then uh, I went off and started making immersive and interactive works uh, that really used game design and um, game theory and game studies as a core to the, my concept of what theatre could be. I really hated the idea that an audience would watch because they're physical human bodies. And if I want you to watch something, then I could throw it on a screen or I could um, um, stream it to you, I guess. But if you're in the room with me, I want you to interact with me. So I would often bring audience members onto stage um, in safe and comforting environments um, so that they could learn something about themselves. So after I did my degree at Melbourne Uni and did a bit of a stint being a professional clown for a while and then did a little bit of stint being an immersive and interactive work maker, I then studied at Swinburne University in game design and psychology um, before heading to the VCA to do an honours in theatre practice. And then after that, I, I now, at the moment, I teach and lecture at Swinburne University in their games degree. And I continue to make artwork that involves the focus of the audience as their major kind of concept. Um, this is just a, an example of some of my work. Uh, I won't go into it because we have to get moving. We have to keep, keep rolling along. Uh, but if you ever see me around free play, I'm happy to talk your ear off all things theatre. Oh, no, sorry, I've got to go back. There's a beautiful transition. I put transitions in. Look at that. Thank you, PowerPoint. There will be some more hidden transitions throughout this experience. That's my dramaturgical decision. Um, I am going to reiterate some things that I spoke at GCAP um, because I think it's really interesting when we look at uh, concepts of uh, interdisciplinary art. Um, and when I talk about interdisciplinary art, I mean art that covers two disciplines. In this case, it's theatre and games. And usually many people, especially in institutionalised and hierarchical concepts of artwork, consider games to be a real, relatively new or um, a budding format, when my argument is, no, it's been around for a, a, a decent amount of time. Uh, and if we want to look at two pieces or two artefacts that um, are examples of how long these two mediums have been around for we go to ancient egypt and obviously there's earlier artifacts there's i think there's an artifact that was found in turkey that's a little bit older than the royal game of ur which is the one on the left there um but it's nice to have kind of a a base point so uh on the right we have um the first review of a theater piece anywhere in the world that we have to this date um it's a theater piece on a religious ceremony uh, it talks about the treasurer who is playing the god Osiris. He is guiding people to the underworld and uh, he gets a good review. He gets he, 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 It says that he um, speaks well and he embodies the god in, in, a, in a very realistic fashion. I'm not sure how he does that, but that's exciting nonetheless. So that clay tablet is uh, from around 1800 BCE-ish. It's hard to really kind of solidify when it's around. But if we look to the left, we see the Royal Game of Ur, which is a precursor to modern day backgammon. And the great thing about this game is that we can certainly play it. And it's played with D4s, or I should say modified D4s. If you're interested, the British Museum has a really great YouTube video about it that you can look up. And it's thought to be made between 2600 and 2400 BCE-ish. So any any institutionalized concept of art and usually unfortunately in a i'm going to get on my socialist high horse in, in a usually in a 
um, capitalist system, institutions really denote value um, and monetary value, especially um, in these concepts. And institutions like uh, Australian arts certainly thinks that theatre is is um, quote unquote more valuable. But really, if you look at this, they've been around together for the beginning of time, I would argue. Since humans started playing, we have had games to play. As soon as, start, as, soon as humans started performing, theatre was born, um, along with dance and, and a whole bunch of artistic practices that we kind of think are strange. But where's that intersection? Where's that moment where theatre and games Ooh, oh yes, it's a theater. It's revealing the Lady of May. This is really the um, first choose your own adventure, which is uh, a play written in the 16th century by Sir Philip Sidney. It's a really, really bad play, and it's a really bad choose your own adventure. Essentially, the there is one choice. And the audience gets to choose um, because the premise of the play is that a woman has two suitors and the audience needs to figure out which suitor is best for her. Um, there are so many problems with that already, but, you know, this is very basic. So the one choice is made by the audience. And unfortunately for 99.9% .9 of the audience, uh, only one person can make that decision. And Philip Sidney wrote this for Queen Elizabeth I. So Queen Elizabeth gets to decide. So it is a choose your own adventure for one person with one choice. Not very exciting. But are there other allegories that we can find or other similes that we can find in um, uh, theatre and games? And I want to bring up one that might not seem very clear. The first one is Commedia dell'arte. Commedia dell'arte was performed throughout Italy and southern France as well as Central Europe. It was a form of uh, what we'll say folk theatre in which players, and we, I've, I've used that term correctly, players uh, would uh, travel around um, Europe and put on masks and each uh, player would um, embody a specific role, a specific role, uh, whether that be the role of Pantalone or Il Capitano, and each one of those roles had a specific um, characteristic or attribute associated with them. Uh, but the funny thing was is that many of the plays uh, that these players did were, were improvised. They had a general, like, beat to them, and eventually, you know, if you're playing Il, Il Capitano, you will eventually be uh, um, kind of embarrassed in front of the audience. But how you get there and how you hit the plot beats uh, was totally up to the players. And if we want to look at a modern-day simile of this, we look no further than the current concept. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yes, fly away. <laughs> the current concept of uh, pen and paper role-playing games. Uh, there's players. They all have specific roles, and it's improvised. And now we have Twitch. Basically, Commedia dell'arte was a critical role for the for the 14th, 15th, and 16th century. Um, and so I honestly think that theatre and games have a lot more in common than we might uh, immediately think of. And I, I'm not even going to get near theatre games. Um, and I probably should should move on from these kind of white dressed, masked strange men uh, and get to the absolute core of what we're going to be discussing today. Get out of here. Um, dramaturgy, dramaturgy. I really love this uh, image. You call this a play. Where's the character development? Where's the conflict resolution? What's my motivation for yelling? Um, and many people would associate the concept of an actor having motivation with uh, a director. And indeed, in modern day canon of um, theater art, um, we often think that the hierarchy of people usually is the director first and then the actors, and then maybe the producers and then set designers and stage managers and so on and so forth, when that's clearly not the case. It takes a whole group of people, a community of people to get anything going. And if you take away even one of those people, um, it can be certainly hard. And I think that can be found within game design as well. You want a team of people around you that have a, a huge set of skills. Uh, but one of the, the most recent, I suppose, 
um, concepts is the dramaturgical uh, person in a room. And a, the dramaturgy, a dramaturgy itself is a term that refers to both the aesthetic architecture of a piece of dramatic literature. So that means its structure, the themes, the goals and the conventions. And alongside that is the practical philosophy of theatre practice, which are both employed to create a full performance. And I really want to emphasise that concept of the full performance, because it's often disregarded the concept that uh, a performance, although what we see on the front is an actor and we celebrate actors, I would argue maybe a little too much, um, we don't celebrate those who have researched and thought deeply and um, poured their blood and soul into making sure this work comes out front. Um, and I think in game design, we're very lucky to have a community where the game team is celebrated rather than the front-facing um, uh, components of that team. And I would argue that one of the things we need for those teams is a dramaturg. I don't know whether we want to keep that term. Maybe there's a different term that we can use. But a dramaturg is a full-time employed person who will be at the very beginning of your work, at the very beginning of your work. And a dramaturg for, for a game will think about the aesthetic architecture of that game. Instead of dramatic literature, it will be uh, a ludic literature. And when I mean ludic, that just means game or, or game studies. Um, you will, that, that, that dramaturg will look at the game's structure, the way that it moves, the themes of the game, the goal of the game. And I don't necessarily mean get your character from point A to B or uh, any number of like solve 20 puzzles in a row and that's the goal of the game. Instead, what is your game trying to do in a wider canon of creative processes? And finally, the conventions. So a dramaturg needs to be aware of the conventions that video games and board games and physical games and games in general have. And then they match that with the philosophy of play and the philosophy of game. And hopefully that would then create a full performance or a full game, a full game. Uh, but I'm already kind of running off my own head a little bit here because even in theatre circles, dramaturgs are really not understood um, and the term is thrown around regularly. Uh, these are two great quotes. Dramaturg, and what does that mean? Having the word is very useful, it's pregnant with association, and I'm obliged to whoever coined it, but uh, that was John Bruner. No one really knows what a dramaturg does. Um, so even if I tell you today, you could go read 20 other books that might tell you something else. I'm just giving you the one that I think is relevant and relatable to video games. And the second one I think is uh, a beautiful example of what a dramaturg does. I can't point to anything specifically, but if you took a knife to that play, it would bleed me. I love that, that quote because I think a dramaturg comes back to this concept of the ghost line. It's going to be an image that I come back to regularly because a dramaturg is above all else someone who cares deeply about whatever you are creating. They care so deeply that they are invested enough that if your game was destroyed, they would feel that a part of them was destroyed too. And it's the number one reason why at the end of this, you know, I, if you're thinking about getting a dramaturg on board for your game process, you want to get them on board as, as early as you can. Uh, because they, you, you need to get them invested. Uh, but yes, that's the number one attribute, care, care. Much like the ghost light. The ghost light in that theatre, its sole purpose is to care. It's to take care of people. And it takes care of people even when they're not there. As I said, the ghost light is on when no one is in the theatre. It's on just in case, just in case. And it cares for all people. It cares for the audience entering and exiting the theatre. It cares for the actors on stage. It cares for the stagehands and the wings. It cares for the lighting managers and, and the prop department and the costume department. It cares for everyone. 
in its own beautiful, luminous way. It just cares. So coming back to who dramaturgs are um, and giving a little bit more in-depth discussion about what a dramaturg does and, and where they fit in, a, in an artistic team. Um, and I, I probably should just mention really quickly uh, that if you have um, a dramaturg, um, you, many people might think that a dramaturg is only needed for a game that has a lot of weight to it, um, that's supposed to be moving or engaging or, um, you know, is, is rupturing the social bounds of, of whatever it might be. But dramaturgs can also be for very fun games and for very menial games or uh, games that you might wants to have people turn off their brain and not engage with anything. Um, and they're there to help you get to that stage. I'll just bring your attention to these weird gestures um, that are Elizabethan gestures that would be used on stage to signify meaning. And I think they're just so beautiful. Um, I especially like listening indulgently. Um, or in, yeah, indulgently. Um, and a dramaturg, although they weren't called dramaturgs at that time, um, would be able to teach actors every single one of these gestures. But a modern context of what a dramaturg is, a dramaturg is a member of an artistic team of a production who is a specialist in the transformation of a dramatic script into a meaningful living performance. A dramaturg is an expert, an expert in the aesthetic philosophy and theatre history. So in this case, that would be game history uh, and aesthetic philosophy for games. Um, they are strong and versatile writers, committed and visionary artists who love being in rehearsal and collaborating with others. So that means they love, uh, for, for game design, they love uh, being in the development room, uh, although they might not actually touch any code or they might not actually touch any assets, um, but they might, they definitely would, you would hope, would play the game. Um, uh, they are not scared of libraries. They are devoted to the principle that theatre and games should be socially as well as artistically relevant. I think that is one of the key things a dramaturg should do. Always place your game, your artistic concept within, excuse me, a social uh, context. They are deeply driven by the aha or the eureka moment of discovery. They are intrepid frontline operators, willing to go boldly where no one has gone before. They are versatile and adaptable, ready to wear a variety of hats in a variety of contexts. So if we, if we want to bring that back to pop culture references, basically you're a far more ethical Indiana Jones uh, mixed with a dash of the crew of the Starship Enterprise who always has a plan. But most importantly, as I said before, you're a caring critic, a person who loves what they're helping and cares deeply for their creators. Um, this image is from the PVI Collective, which is the, this awesome game theatre co company in, in Perth. Um, and their entire company is always about disrupting social norms, which I love. I'm going to read out a fairly long quote, so relax. Um, sit back and kind of let it wave over you um, from an artist called Yavadi. Um, and this is a poem that Yavadi wrote to uh, their dramaturgs. Uh, so a dramaturg to me is to fix my head in general, to bring me back to the ground, to make me a doctor of my conceptual thoughts, to explain to me why I can or cannot do, to tell me what is happening from my materials, what is happening from my beliefs and how I can communicate them to make sure I am communicating, to make sure I am not just presenting my associations of narratives, but my line of thought is communicating has a logic that can be understood, to tell me things I don't know, to make me rethink myself and the piece, to make me fall in love with the materials that I think are stupid and to break up with the materials that I think are genius to make me be clear, to make me be responsible for my own acts, to hold my hand when I'm lost, to make me be lost and remind me that it is fine to be lost, to break my heart when something doesn't work, but to believe in what I'm doing to the very end when I am not successful with what I thought I could do, to believe in me and the project while at the same time crushing it to dust, asking what I want all the time and making me tell them what I want, to tell me 
what the piece knows much better than I do. The dramaturg is the most important and intimate position in my process. It should be based on time and love. And I don't think there are better words that can really summarize what a dramaturg does. They are relentless for your possibility. They are relentless for your practice. They want to see the best from you and they care for you, not in a capitalist potential fulfilling way in, in regards to like, you have a potential, I am going to force this out of you, but they are nurturing as well. They are deeply, deeply caring. And if there's one thing this industry needs more than ever at any time is care and love. And that is what a dramaturg brings to a production. Love, love. We can never fail with love. So if you're interested in being a dramaturg, if you think, hey, you know what, I I care about other people's projects, I want to help them, I want to be a, a dramaturg, that is fantastic and I highly recommend you go read this book as well as read a whole bunch of other books about dramaturgs. But I'm just going to give you the real basics of what a dramaturg might do for your project and what a dramaturg um, can do um, for your wider artistic practice. Uh, and, and to be honest, if you're already in the industry, and you know a lot and you are, you're happy to mentor, you can be a dramaturg too. Um, here are some formats. So here are the three formats that a dramaturg kind of works through. Uh, the first one is uh, determining what the aesthetic architecture of a piece of dramatic literature, in this case, dramatic game actually is. So that's the analysis. Asking those questions of um, what is the history behind this work? What does the work invoke from me? Um, what does the work look like? Um, and uh, I'm going to skip the, yeah, I'll come back to that in a second. The second one is discovering everything needed to transform that inert script into a living piece of theatre. So if we just change the words around, it's very easy. Uh, discover everything needed to transform that inert game uh, or play. I think play, that's a better word. That inert play into a living piece of game. Oh, that's, oh, my life, sorry. <laughs> uh, and that comes with research. So that that might be you're making a puzzle game or you're making an escape room. You need to, as a dramaturg, you come in knowing the history of escape rooms. You come in understanding deeply what the artist wants to convey, and that comes from the analysis. Um, and then researching any other artists who have attempted to convey the same, same things. But not only that, you will research the contextual landscape in which the art is being made. And we'll, again, come back to that in a few slides. I promise, I promise. The third one is applying the knowledge in a way that makes sense to a living audience at this time and in this place, i.e. the practical application. They are your, um, I'll say, prime play tester. They have to come in and play the game as if they've never played it before. And they are going to be silly, brutal. They are going to ask questions uh, and hopefully they'll find bugs. But your QA testers almost kind of do that in, in, in a beautiful way as well. They're, they're, they're parts of a dramaturg. There are two approaches though that a dramaturg really flourishes in. The first approach is the semiotic approach. So semiotics is the understanding and study of symbols and this is a great one from the the author of the book the answer is that in this case it was theater uh, that a game is a machine one that manufactures meaning and it is irresponsible for game designers to think that their games don't manufacture meaning in some way that there isn't some kind of grand narrative that is being um, dissolved into the player's mind uh, and certainly there are a lot of games out there that don't think about how their semiotics are affecting their players and what messages those players are just getting indoctrinated with. So I'll run through some basic semiotics with us all, just very, very briefly. The first one is this one. Um, it's a red octagonal shape, which is fine, which is great, but if we break it down to its core material, that's it. However, if we look at the semiotics of this shape, there is a meaning behind the symbol that we, or that I think most people around the world would recognize, or at least maybe in the Western world, uh, would, would recognize. And that is a, that it's a stop sign. As we can see here, there's no lettering. We don't need the symbols of words to tell us what this means. It is a stop sign and it tells you what you're supposed to do, i.e. stop. 
uh, very simple semiotics. But the dramaturg will look at that sign and look at it through various different lenses. Does the stop sign convey to the players? How would the players misrepresent that stop sign? How could we use the convention of the stop sign as a way to enhance the meaning of the game? The next image I'm going to show provides a little bit more context. Um, these are various mouse cursors. Well, it's a mouse cursor. Um, maybe a couple of them. Uh, they're trees. They're trees. Um, and sadly, sadly, um, we recognize them as trees. It's because of imperialism and, and colonialism, and we live in, in a uh, state that has been colonized, so we recognize Eurocentric images and symbols. Um, and so we immediately look at these images and we go, great, they're trees, but these aren't trees. It's very rare that I walk down the street and see one of these. I have never seen, I've, I, honestly, I've never seen a tree that looks like that, some of these. Um, and a dramaturg, but because uh, because we are so immersed within a, a certain Eurocentric culture, we don't think twice. Game designers might go, cool, they, they look like trees. People understand that they look like trees. But a dramaturg will look at these images and they'll say, but why are you using these trees? What messages are you sending with these trees? If you're an Australian designer and you're using these trees for a game that's set in Europe, that's great. But you wouldn't use these trees in an Australian-based game, hopefully. You would care for our gums, our natural eucalypts. They're beautiful, and they deserve to be seen as well. And a dramaturg would place the context of these images and these symbols within that game design. All right, I've used some pretty cheap and pretty easy um, <laughs> symbols so far. And hopefully you're understanding or I'm reiterating enough that the dramaturg will, will kind of look at these with fresh eyes. But this is a classic um, image within games. Uh, when I teach at Zwimburn, I, this is one image I bring up, um, and the students fundamentally recognize these two things, and they say they're health bars. And I always ask, how do you know that? There's a health bar and there's a mana bar, and I don't know which one's which. Um, students go, well, red is always a health bar and blue is always the mana bar. Um, and that might be true. And I, I think it is true. Let's, the, I, I, in conventional games, that's, that's what it is. Um, a dramaturg will look at those and say, why the hell is the health bar red? And why is the mana bar blue? What does mana mean? Why is it blue? And what is the history behind that? What are you trying to tell your audience with having magic be blue? Is magic associated with water? Is magic associated with Polynesian culture in regards to calling it mana, which it has nothing to do with in most cases? Why is there a health bar? What, what else do we need? So even very simple semiotics that we have um, can have various readings and meanings. And it's up to the dramaturg to sit down and break every single one of these down to its finite point, which would take ages. Yes, it would take ages. If it that if you had to have every one of your assets re-looked at and kind of like scoured over um, by a dramaturg, then it would take a while. It would take a long time. But I would argue that time would be well spent. Um, a dramaturg can provide for you new insights, new ideas, uh, make you question your own conventions and concepts. And the problem is, is that many, or well, maybe I'm general. I'm definitely generalizing here. I'll just, I'll just be a generalist for a second. Uh, but a lot of games that are made are usually made without ever questioning the conventions of game, without ever questioning what it means to be a designer, what power you have as a designer, and what messages you're sending with your game. And indeed, the kind of philosopher Stuart Hall argued if there is no meaning taken, there can be no consumption. If someone plays your game and they don't get any meaning out of it, nothing is taken away. Nothing is taken away. 
Now, I guess if you're really making a game that has no meaning, you still need a dramaturg because the dramaturg will find examples in real life about when meaning was disassociated with something. Hopefully I'm making sense. Hopefully this is making sense, people. I don't know. It's hard to tell. I'm, I'm not getting into like physical feedback. It's very strange, very strange format. Hopefully it is. All right. So here are some questions I'm going to throw, I'm going to give to you um, that I made up um, when we're talking about semiotics. So if you can't, if you can't find yourself a dramaturg, but ask these, the, this is the strange thing that we ask these questions. So when someone asks, what is the game about? Here are the, this is the hierarchy of responses that we usually get. That when, when someone says, hey, what, what's your game about? Um, we might have, uh, how do you play this game? Oh, well, it's a puzzle game. And the way you play this game is, is blah, blah, blah. Um, it might even be the goal of the game. Uh, oh, well, the game's about getting from A to B. Um, it's a platformer that gets you from A to B. The third one usually is the thematic. So, oh, our game's about being a ninja, jumping from roof to roof. Uh, and finally, the, the fourth and the fifth one usually never get answered. What is this game trying to tell us? Oh, our platformer game is trying to tell you that if you get from A to B, you'll get from A to B, which is pretty cool if you ask me. Um, or even why should we care about this game? Honestly, what we need to do as a, as, as a, as a community is we need to inverse this, this list of, of questions. The first thing that we should always ask ourselves is why should we care about this game? Why should I care about this game? It's something that I ask myself whenever I'm about to make a piece of theatre. It's very good. It's very good for killing bad ideas. Why should I care about this piece of theatre that I want to make? My partner, a beautiful person. I always ask my partner, like I say, hey, um, I want to make this piece of theatre about driving in a car and you have a playlist of all your romantic teenage songs that you kind of immediately go back towards. And uh, my partner always says, well, why should we care about that? Why should we care about you, David, your romantic love songs? Basically, they're the soundtrack from Romeo and Juliet. I won't get into it. I'll tell you another time. Um, and I sit there and I go, yeah, why, why should they care? Maybe they do, but that's a great question to start with. It's not a question that's going to stop me from making the game or making the piece of theatre, but it's one that's really going to contextualise why I need to make this game. And if I really love that idea or if I really love that piece of theatre concept, then I'm going to go do it. And I'm going to find out why I care about this. The second one I always come to is then, why am I trying to make this piece of work? What is it trying to tell a, a, a wider audience? Why does this need to be made right now in this context, in this age? And I tell you what, there's a lot of stuff out there that doesn't need to be made. A lot of voices that, you know, are better off listening and letting other people rise to the top. Um Certainly, uh, certainly a lot more people need to listen. A lot more people need to listen. Um, the second approach is the phenomenological approach. I like that word. It's a beautiful word, phenomenological approach. Um, phenomenology is the study of experience, the study of experience. Um, and I think this is a beautiful quote. Art enables us to find ourselves and lose ourselves at the very same time. So if semiotics is the meaning behind everything, Phenomenology is the experience behind everything. Usually when you're experiencing something that's scary, you'll have an immediate reaction in your body, an immediate reaction in your body. And that reaction, uh, you don't have time to think. You don't sit there. Um, I, I, I was in an elevator and it started to fall recently. It was very scary. It, it, it jutted and started to fall momentarily. And I tell you what, my body just like, and I, I have anxiety and it's very hard sometimes <laughs> and it certainly wasn't good in that state, but my, my body just went into flight or fight response. I didn't sit there and go, by the way, David, the elevator is falling. I think you should set your adrenal glands on high alert. Uh, my body just did it. And that's what phenomenology is, is like, how, what do you experience when you experience a room? Uh, or what do you experience when you experience a sound? or even a set of letters, um, an aesthetic choice. And I tell you what, I'm going to show you one of my favorite aesthetic choices ever. Here it is. Ooh, beautiful. The 70s. 70s shape chart. Oh, I love this image so much. This is, oh, how, mm. it certainly is, is an aesthetic. It certainly is an aesthetic. Um, <laughs> but 
the experience of walk of, of seeing this room, you had uh, a visceral response to it before you started thinking about it. Um, some people, when they see things that disgust them, they, they make a noise and you can't help but make the noise. Uh, you don't go, buddy, make the noise, do it now. Um, it's, that's a phenomenological experience. So when you're standing in a 70s shag carpeted room, um, that is different for you standing in a, a modern day room. Uh, which is different to standing in a shag carpeted room in the 70s. You can't experience that. Bringing that back to games, when we think about games, often we're thinking about user design. We're thinking about how will the user and how will the player experience this, and that is fantastic. That's actually what we want. But I think more depth and more um, uh, investigation needs to be approached when, when in regards to how we uh, address the player and their experience. So the, that's the that's the price of the dramaturg. The dramaturg sits down, plays your game, has done a whole bunch of research on human behavior, psychology, uh, emotive responses, emotional valences. I'll sit down and play your game and say, hey, that red balloon made me feel like this. Uh, when the sound of this, the jumping, makes me feel like this. Uh, and they will list off all the things that they have experienced while playing your game, which is absolutely vital. And sure, you get that through play testers, absolutely. But then on top of that, they look at the red balloon and they say, hey, the red balloon is a signifier of these things. So it makes me feel like this. And once I've had a moment to think about it, it makes me feel like this. They'll have a research behind them that will then uh, enable you to experience and to uh, um, embed new meaning and new affordances and new beautiful uh, kind of feelings involved in the game. Uh, one of my favorite things is uh, uh, goals <laughs> um, and, and sports. So sports, for instance, there is a very clear difference, a very clear uh, experiential difference between playing FIFA and playing soccer. Uh, they're very, very different. And in fact, I would argue that many people who play FIFA actually might hate playing soccer. They might really dislike it, but they enjoy playing FIFA. They enjoy the experience of FIFA. It's also uh, a phenomenological experience of watching a team that you love or that you care about scoring a goal. Um, that is very different to the person who actually scored the goal. What does this mean? Well, again, coming back to user experience, um, the user experience is this concept that uh, obviously that the user, each person will play this game slightly differently and have different experiences through that game. And that's absolutely fine and, 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 and dandy. And we need a few more uh, considered and well thought out approaches to what experiences we are attempting to convey. Um, and that comes back to those semiotic questions. Um, very quickly. <laughs> Don Quixote is a really good example of someone who uh, lacks the phenomenological uh, experience. They see things purely as semiotics. Uh, Don Quixote looks at the uh, uh, looks at the windmills and and reads the windmills and says, "Ah, oh, windmills. They're tall. They've got wide arms. Uh, they make groaning sounds. Ah." The semiotics tells me that that is a giant, that that has similar attributes that a giant has, where Don Quixote needs to experience, like the experience of fighting a giant and the experience of fighting a windmill, I can only imagine are very, very different. I've never fought a giant before. Many I've fought many windmills and they've all been troublesome. Um, but uh, the experience of a windmill is its own, is its own unique thing. And if you're making a game based on and previous work, maybe you've, uh, maybe you want to make a platform, or maybe you may want to make something that uh, you reiterate on something. It needs to be its own experience. It needs to be its completely new, own, lived, wonderful pet that you have to take care of and you have to nurture and help along. So here are the questions that I have for phenomenology. So how does this game make you feel, or how does this game feel? Um, so the first one is, what is the experience I want my players to have? And a lot of people refer to other games when they when they have that 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 first question. They're like, "Oh, we want it to feel like Minecraft, or we want it to feel like uh, hide and seek." No, 
you can't have it feel like all those things. And even if you did, you probably don't want to make a clone of something else. Think outside of your medium. Whenever I'm making a piece of work, I always think about outside of the theatre. I, I need to watch theatre to be able to be inspired, to able to know what theatre can possibly do and hopefully see the fringes of what theatre is. Um, but if I have this, uh, if I only know what theatre is, I'm only ever going to make what I know. Um, so what is the experience I want my players to have? In one of my classes recently, I, I challenged a team to make a game that, ex that the experience when you're playing that game feels like... Um, reading a book in bed on a rainy night if that's what you want your game to be that is amazing and i think we need to look towards those kind of more abstract and surreal concepts of what it would experience what is your favorite experience and make and just like distill that into a game format is that possible maybe not but it's okay to experiment what are the verbs that uh, you want them to use when describing their game to other people? God, it was stealthy. Uh, I, you know, I was jumping, running, hiding, um, loving, whatever it might be. What images, memories, thoughts do I hope to f my players to find? And I think walking simulators are really good with this. Walking simulators um, like uh, uh, Gone Home have these beautiful images and memories and thoughts that are embedded within the game that could po only possibly come from a, an experienced um, uh, position. And in a wider context, why do my players need to feel these things? One of the most important things I was ever told was, David, stop making people... Uh, so I was making this awful work. It was awful. It was all about, I was like, oh, I was young. I was like, oh, Stanford prison experiment. Oh, isn't that cool? Oh, that's pretty edgy. Oh, I'm going to make people feel things. Oh, I'm going to make them feel things. And uh, a mentor of mine turned to me and said, why? Why does anyone need to feel that anymore? What What does that, what purpose does that serve in, in today's context? And I was like, yeah, what purpose does that serve? So I made the opposite. I made the opposite of the Stanford Prison Experiment, which is, you know, this lovely experience of, of, of nurturing and caring um, because I didn't see why that experience was needed anymore. Smashing it. Let's go. In other words, dramaturgs are there to keep you on track, to keep your artistic vision in um, as a whole. And to, and to make you responsible, to make you a responsible artist. They ask you why you have chosen this game at this present moment in history in front of any audience. Why should anyone see this work? Why is it important? To what concerns of ours and theirs does it speak? For what that matter? Who, who is our audience? Who are we? What is it that we wish to say? Why is it that the, t why is this format the best way to say it do we have anything new to say or are we recapitulating an older idea are we making room for diverse and and underutilized voices how will we make it relevant how will we make it work what values do we wish to convey what values do we actually convey why are we doing a game and not some other form of art or political action is your game political action why are we doing this and not something else? Why not another game? Why are we doing games at all? The clearer your response to these questions is, the better you will know what you are doing and what kind of outcome you desire. That's from uh, the Ghostlight book. I've just edited it so that you let's put it in the games. Because as game designers, we forget we have huge responsibility, huge responsibility. Because what we feed to our audiences, they take towards their daily life. Media is manipulation. And we would hope that what we are creating only manipulates people into a more caring society. And I'm certainly pushing my agenda tonight. And that's okay. I think, I, I think I'm allowed to a little bit. Um, a more caring, loving, and uh, um, engaging community than before. And if you're not working towards that goals, that is absolutely fine. But you need to understand where your game sits and where your art sits in that wider context. So summary. Here's the summary. A dramaturg is a historian, researcher, art critic who has a deep understanding of how signs, signals, and concepts are received and sent, who makes sure that the experience of the project is key. They are a mentor, a friend, an enemy, cutting away that which you think needs to stay and nursing that which you think needs to be cut. 
They are socially engaged and critically minded about your work. They under they sorry they understand why this needs to be made sooner rather than later. They love you and love your team and believe that your team has the potential to make great things. They care. They are the ghost light. The family, friends, mentors, teachers, and outside consultants are all absolutely fantastic. But the sole job of the ghost light is to care and care forever. And someone whose job is dedicated to this craft of caring is unmeasurably beneficial to any team. So that is why your team needs a drama Turk. And I've got to find a way to turn off the screen sharing. Oh, where am I? There I am. So there, that's it. That's it. Um, so I'm going to answer any questions now. Um, how can aspiring dramaturg make sure they're well equipped to do their job or to create their job? Whew, okay, I'll, I'll be honest. Um, dramaturgs, even in theatre, are struggling. I think there's two full-time dramaturgs in theatre in uh, Australia at the moment, let alone creating dramaturgs for a whole new um, uh, industry that hasn't even been broached yet. My number one piece of advice is um let's 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 deal with the equipped first the first thing is that you need to be a master of your craft um so you need to uh, a lot of research a lot of reading um you need to know the canon of games the history of games where games have come from um and that's just researching just lots of researching the second thing that i think you need to do if you if you want to become a game dramaturg is that you need to then play lots of games um and i don't mean games that you've that are in your wheelhouse i mean games that are totally outside of your comfort zone um personally i hate horror games i swear at my screen whenever i play them but i try and play them i try and play them usually i'm cuddling up with my cat or you know asking my partner if they're in the house um uh, but another thing I do is I, whenever I travel anywhere, I always buy a local game. Um, and by buying new games, by playing new games, by playing with new people, by engaging in different communities, um, by not uh, being a you know turn of the century anthropologist putting on my pith helmet and, and appropriating cultures, instead of actually understanding and being respectful, um, I can understand the games that they're playing and then take those concepts of values hopefully into the games that I would consult on. On that note, probably the greatest dramaturgs that you can ask that that have lived knowledge, embodied knowledge, are people outside of your community, um, whether that be um, ethnically, sexually, um, whether that be uh, religiously, uh, spiritually. Um, uh, they, if you could look at people outside of your uh direct community people that you're you don't engage with often um that they, they are they make amazing dramaturgs because they will call you out on stuff that you didn't realize and you didn't know the second one um uh, uh or to create their job so the best way for a dramaturg that they don't exist they don't exist in video games yet i don't know whether i don't think they exist in video games yet but i think the the, the closest thing and i think this is answering what role overlaps with dramaturg well um is uh i think um uh consultants usually consultants or mentors mentors are really good uh if we're talking about like a paid position in a in a in a games um uh unit uh i, I would probably say the artistic director um or narrative designer or even you know head game designer um however the the most important thing for the dramaturg is that they're outside of that creative process that they that they actually come in regularly um as the outside eye um but they're not embedded in the day-to-day -day creation of the of, of the work so i would argue that they're probably the the, the two things hopefully that's answered your question Neurodiver um, and Maze, Maze, yeah, hopefully that answered your question as well. I would argue that probably the um, uh, creative director of, of, a, of a company uh, should, is closer to the dramaturg, but they're already, they're so embedded in it. They, there's a classic quote um, uh, 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 We don't know who discovered water, but it certainly wasn't a fish. 
because fish already are immersed within the world so they actually don't question what is around them it's just like that's their life it only takes someone else outside of that so i would say a creative director is too embedded in their own uh, world um goldry uh, wondering about your thoughts on asking a player to dig for all the, of the content versus being upfront and bold with it. Ah, that's, oh, I love this. This is one of my favorite things. I, and sorry, I had a huge argument with a friend recently and he's, uh, and, and since then he, he's going to change his mind. Um, but he read somewhere and this was the most pretentious arty thing. I was so annoyed at this. Um, this, this, this art theorist was saying, oh, well, you know, what's most important in um, a theater and art is the depth of meaning rather than the, the access of meaning. And I was like, you, you serious? Um, artists, and I don't know about in game design, I, I, would, I, I don't think so. I don't think game design fits this, but uh, theater at least, there's a lot of emphasis on being very smart and very being very like uh, ooh, um, mysterious. Um, and that, you know, the intellectual elite, the artistic elite will understand my work. It's a, it's a, a, a clay pigeon on a shelf and it means everything um uh my 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 thought is that uh if i can help people understand my work they will like i i, I want to do that i want to invite them into my work there is no downside to being accessible no downside whether that's theoret theoretically or intellectually um so i would say that uh digging for all the content what you want to do is you want to let them dig first and then if they're not getting it or if, they, if they're not understanding it you want to make you want to give it to them you want to you want to help them um kind of understand the way i do that personally is i give them an artistic statement so whenever you come to my work i give you an artistic statement and i ask you whether you want to read it at the end or the beginning usually people want to read it at the end because they want to go in and like kind of have a fresh view and they read the semiotics the way they read it and they the phenomenological experience is different for them and at the end they read it and they go oh wait the clay pigeon is a reference to or oh, whatever it might be um so my my argument is that clarity of meaning accessibility of meaning always trumps depth of meaning always trumps depth of meaning and that there's we should be kind and generous artists and accessibility should always be there for um uh our our practice neve cool hi neve how you doing um do you think that dramaturgs may serve a role similar to sensitivity readers or that they make well well make may work well in tandem with sensitivity readers uncovering unexpected semiotics and what they could mean yes yep absolutely i i would argue that um uh, dramaturgs should have um a background in sensitivity um diversity training um and that's why i argue that the best dramaturgs that you can get are from diverse communities um people that um have understand clearly um uh privilege and uh not not because not that they will privilege hopefully i don't know i'm getting into my murky water there but um uh i would say that uh they uh can consult uh from many different communities hopefully and provide sensitivity and understanding for those communities absolutely great semiotics you know meaning can be found in a lot of things and even today i was uh helping some students i was like well that looks a bit weird and i wouldn't do that because in this culture it means this uh Frazier, how is a game dramaturg different from roles like creative director or lead designer so i so um may's ask uh, may's asked earlier what was the role overlaps with dramaturg and they kind of overlap you know um dramaturg does uh overlap a lot with creative director and a good designer the only problem with the creative director as i said earlier is that they're embedded within the work so if you're embedded within the work it can be very hard to see the tree from the forest um and one of the major things that a dramaturg does is they look from the outside and they go hey by the way you've been working on this game for like two months and that thing reads like this and as a creative designer um you're like no it doesn't it should read like this uh so they're the outside eye they shouldn't actually be in every single day. They should be brought in regularly as um, a member of the team, but they shouldn't be in the day-to-day -day creative process of um, the work. Uh, so they come in regularly, um, usually at intervals, um, and kind of help uh, the work fulfill its meaning. But absolutely, the creative director and um, lead designer should do a lot of the work, and the, the dramaturg comes in and, and kind of adds extra work on top of it. 
I think that's the last question. So thank you all so much for watching and um, have a wonderful rest of your week at Free Play Festival. I'll hopefully see you around. I'm more than welcome to answer any questions that you might have been too shy to, to write up and uh, have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your evening. See you at Free Play.